First of all, let me tell you about my next live broadcast that takes place tomorrow, Tuesday the 2nd of April at 1700 hours UK time. I'm going to be previewing the candidates and also it'll just be a general Q&A. So do join me and I'll show you a few positions as well. And I've got a special guest too. So do join me for that. Next live, live broadcast tomorrow, Tuesday the 2nd of April. In my last broadcast, I interviewed the Dutch Grandmaster Paul van der Steren about uh, two books that he just had published in English. And in a moment, I'm going to show you a short extract from that interview. Uh, I've often found chess autobiographies to be a bit frustrating to read. Uh, there's often lots of analysis, but how often do we get to hear how the player was actually feeling you know before the game during the game after the game you know there's there's so much bravado in chess I, I plead guilty to that myself you know when I was a professional player you you can't let your game face down um, but in fact everyone is racked by insecurities and well all kinds of emotions you know no matter whether you're amateur or professional so for that reason, the two books just published um, by New in Chest, written by Paul van der Steren, I think are superb books. They, they really appeal to me. In Black and White, that's Paul's chess autobiography, that was published, uh, first of all, in Dutch in, in the Netherlands in, around 11 years ago. And it became a cult classic in the Netherlands, but it's now been translated into English. So, okay, why did it become such a kind of cult classic? Well, it's so candid. Paul reveals his feelings in great detail. You know, the highs, lows, the triumphs, the disasters, his feelings of mastery, his feelings of inadequacy. It's deeply personal and wholly rela relatable. And then there's this little book, this short book. It's about 120 pages. Very nice book. Beautifully produced, actually, but new in chess. It's called Mindful Chess, The Spiritual Journey of a Professional Chess Player. And again, I think it's a remarkable book. So Paul takes things a step further in, in this book and focuses purely on the mind. I think Paul has always been interested in philosophy, particularly Eastern philosophy. And a few years ago, he took up meditation. So this book is an attempt to explain why and how his meditation helped his chess, how he came to terms with the end of his chess career, and how he processed in his mind his chess career. You know, why he played, uh, coming to terms with results. I mean, that's not easy for all of us. So Paul van der Steren was a professional professional chess player. So is are these two books interesting for amateurs as well? Well I would say very much so. No matter what level we play, you know, we all all subject to the same emotions. And I think I mean I certainly got a great deal out of uh, reading these two books, and I, I'm sure you will too. So you can both buy both books directly from New in Chess. I'll put the links down below. And what I've done is I've selected an extract from our interview. Um, the interview lasted well over an hour, but this, this is much shorter. And it's the point in the interview where we discuss a game that we played uh, ourselves. In fact, we played several times uh, over, over the years in various tournaments. And this game contained a remarkable finish. I won't say anything more than that. It is truly extraordinary. And for me, it brought back all kinds of memories that uh, were hidden very deep and, yeah, brought brought things flooding back again. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this es extract. And I do warmly recommend Paul van der Steren's books. Aha! Now, what have we got here? Mm -hmm. I don't know why I've been given an American flag here. That's, <laughs> that's uh, some strange quirk of the software. So, yeah. do you know what? Uh, this is really interesting because when I was, I've been reading the book over your book over the past 
week. Mm. And I came to this this open tournament, Ostend, in 1984, yes. and I had quite forgotten that mm. we'd actually played in Ostend in 1984. Mm. I mean, we've played a few times over the years. Yes. And it suddenly brought back this flood of memories. Ah. And, and this game... Good. I don't have this in my database, actually. And uh -huh. suddenly, yeah, all these thoughts came back to me. It nice. was a very long game, a nice. really long game. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you know, that's actually what exactly what happened to me when I was writing the book. When I went through uh, all the games that I had uh, saved, uh, this was exactly what happened to me. That while going through the moves and sometimes also through my own comments after the game mm. uh, all these memories came back to me mm. so that was actually what enabled me to make it a more um, psychological book if you like mm. and not just a, a chess technical uh, story well let me tell you one of the memories i have of this which i'd completely forgotten mm -hmm. was i don't know do you remember an english player called john nicholson i haven't yes, seen him yes. for a few years yeah. actually very mm. nice guy um and we we must have adjourned this game at move 40. We did, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure what move 40 is, but uh, we did adjourn, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. and I mean, actually, the whole game was, from, from my memory, it was very complicated. I mean, you only give a little extract of the, the, yeah. the end of the game, but I, yeah. I think it was an, uh, some kind of F4 Grand Prix attack. That I something. played as white, yeah. Yeah. something like that. Did it go e4, c5, f4, e6, knight f3, d5, bishop b5, check something like this? Possibly it was that, yes. yeah. It definitely I... was a uh, semi close Sicilian, yeah. But I'd have to look it up now. I, yeah. I've forgotten how it went. It, it definitely was a very tense game, yeah. A very, very complex game because I think you, you castled, I castled kingside, and I think you castled queenside. And advanced mm. your queenside pawns as well. So it was it was a really complex game, and and the adjourned position from memory. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember it was it was still highly complex. But yeah. I think we had something like like an hour or an hour and a half to analyse before we actually resumed. I mean, it was really a tight schedule. Yes, I suppose so. Um... At least that was a sort of standard schedule, yeah. wasn't it? We started at perhaps one one o'clock in the afternoon, five hours of play, mm. uh, break at six o'clock, and then probably at eight o'clock or thereabouts, uh, resumption. Yeah. And I think I, I went to eat something with John, John Nicholson, mm -hmm. and, you know, we were... We were sort of analysing the game a little bit because it's that <laughs> there was always mm. that feeling, you know, when you have such a short break. I mean, mm. people will have no concept of what an adjourned game is yeah. and what it was like to play an adjourned yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. you have that thing, oh my goodness, you've just been playing for over five hours. Yeah. You're, you're tired, you're desperately hungry, yeah. uh, but you also want to analyse this game. Yeah, yeah. And... Yeah. It really wasn't clear what your sealed move would be. I I couldn't, I, mm. you know, it was really difficult. And I remember John suggested a move. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, very arrogantly, yeah, <laughs> Sally, Sally says, what is an adjourned game? It's where you stop the game, you break the game, mm -hmm. and the player to move writes down their intended move and it's put in an envelope. Their score sheet is put in an envelope. The arbiter takes the envelope and then you resume the game after a certain period of time, one or two hours. So that's what an adjourned game is. So John said, suggested a move. And I said, I will bet you 50 beers that Paul will never play that move. Okay. And we continued analysing, and what happened? Uh huh. Of course, you lost fifty beers. Yeah. I lost fifty beers. 
Mm. Ah, <laughs> oh, Sally said it was a rhetorical question. Yeah, and John, being such a nice guy, said, don't worry about the fifth. I was very sheepish after the game, and he said, don't worry about it. <laughs> He's a very, very nice guy. It was, it was, wow. I, I exclaimed it more in kind of, oh, don't be ridiculous and of course you played this move so that's that was one of my memories of playing this game and the other memory is that yes i messed up this game but i had no recollection how but we're Mm. going to see how so first of all it's white to play i'm playing white we both have past pawns my past pawn is just one step from promotion Mm. yours is two steps behind so basically Mm. I stand better with white. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to throw it out there to our viewers. If you were playing white, how would you play here? And it's funny, looking at this now, I mean, you you, you gave a forced win in your analysis, uh, mm. which, is, which is fair enough. Mm. <laughs> Agent M838 says, I'd take the 50 beers in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, yes, there's a forced win. But actually, I understand why I played the move I played. <laughs> mm. Because it's a practical move. Well, as far as I remember, um, you had been winning for quite some time. And we were both surprised how tricky this ending mm. still is. Yes. So I remember a feeling of satisfaction that I managed to get you into this tricky queen ending absolutely oh. yeah and and it was indeed it was far more difficult than i'd imagined and i completely overlooked your very clever idea um so anyone oh, i'm not getting a suggestion from our viewers i'm not surprised because it's it isn't so easy no, actually it's, it's not it isn't so easy and making a decision in this position isn't isn't easy either i mean you can't call this a simple win because there's so many alternatives you've got to pick out exactly the right variation yeah and and at this stage we're probably into i don't know perhaps even sixth seventh hour of playing yeah i suppose so um vicente is suggesting queen f8 um Hmm. It could be a good move. I don't know. <laughs> well, we really have to look into it. Uh, I suppose D2 is the move to look at. Mm. Or maybe Queen F4 check, eliminating the Queens, then D2. And then... Well, we'll... We, we, we reach something similar to that. Mm. Um, yes, we have... Beloglavi suggests Queen G6, and in fact, this is something that you mentioned in the book. I mean, it's sort of the mm. move that White would like to play, but actually, ah, yeah. this results yeah. in a perpetual check. Yes, that's the the first point about yeah. the position that mm. this does not win for White. Yeah, that, that's what makes it difficult. Yeah. This, of course, would have been um, the easy solution, but it doesn't work. Yeah. In fact, you give a variation in the book. Um, You give Queen F6 check. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to play this out because when I played through it, Mm -hmm. I I didn't find this at all (laughs) simple, I have to say. I think you, you gave an annotation. However, White has a rather simple win. Hmm, A4. I mean, it's A4. Wow. That's a really great move, actually. And and one of the points is that it's possible, actually, to exchange queens with queen B5. Ah, right, um, yes. But yeah. I don't know. Simple, I'm not sure. No, simple is not the right word, I yeah. suppose. It's a <laughs> bit arrogant even to call this a simple win but i suppose that's the way we talked about our games uh, back then but it's interesting i put this into the computer i'm afraid Mm -hmm. good i'm lazy and Mm -hmm. the computer suggested queen g5 and actually Ah. that is relatively simple 
Okay. Because after, well, first of all, there's a threat, and it, it covers F4, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, well, D2 can be taken, and white yeah. retains that pawn. Yeah. And if queen g8, well, this gains a big tempo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, queen g8 can never be a yeah, good move. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if I have to uh, play queen g8, it's it's a very clear win. So prob well, prob I, I probably... I don't remember uh, queen g5 at all, but no. uh, if the computer says so, and it does look convincing, I must say. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the best that black has is simply to give the d pawn but of course once white retains the pawn on g7 oh i've got it douglas griffin has just joined mm. uh, the, the the broadcast and he says can i just say what a wonderful book in black and white is i got my copy last week and it's been very hard to put down there you are that's oh, wow. Doug, douglas that's how exactly how i feel about the book because i've been i've only had it for a week and I haven't finished it because it's a big book <laughs> and I've really enjoyed reading it actually. So yeah, there we are. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you very much, Douglas. Okay, so let's have a look at what I played. So I played a practical move. I took this pawn yeah. um, because I mean, I can imagine that I would have felt, well, it eliminates these kind of perpetuals. That's one thing. Yeah. And yeah. I can't play d2 because of queen d6. So it, it it looks like a very sound move. Yeah, it's n I don't. It's not a bad move, but it's not winning. Um, so the game went like this, mm. and and here, well, this is interesting because I played. I think you say in the book that we were both in time pressure. Okay. And I played king h4, which was. Yeah, slightly. You said it was a slightly shocking move, but in mm. fact, it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose you are you are looking at queen takes d two, queen c seven check, and you will lose your pawn on g seven, and you are trying to improve on that variation. Yeah, and all, I I think it sort of makes sense because the you tuck I tuck the king out of the way and. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I give you a move, um, mm. but you simply played queen f7, and then we exchanged pawns, actually. Mm, yeah, and then it probably comes down to the same thing. Yeah, yeah. and here is where I missed your idea. Yeah. And yeah. you say that if I'd simply played g5, mm -hmm. this would still... Black would still have faced a hopeless task. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly, yeah. It's It's... I mean, it's certainly winning for white, but um, yeah, mm. queens. I've learned to respect queens over the years. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> they're I so suppose, tricky. Uh, I but suppose I, there would have been some life in the position yet. But yeah, but it's it's winning. But I played queen d three, which is one of those moves that feels secure. Yeah, yeah. But I had complete because it protects this i mean but it's quite possible i hadn't even appreciated that this was the best move perhaps i was expecting the, the king to go back or i don't know what i thought um and this is protected and i must have just thought well okay this is winning now before you say anything else paul mm -hmm. i'm going to hand this over to our viewers so black to play what should black play here Black to play. Oh, it's gone very quiet over there suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> Black to play. Oh, everyone's obviously just thinking very hard. It's not a matter of thinking hard, it's <laughs> a matter of thinking simple. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing is. This particular theme is mm. probably one of my favorite themes in chess, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. There we go. And suddenly, yeah, Volker, Alex, uh, why many in my shoes, stalemate. Yeah, they've they've all got it. Yeah, well done. Yes. Yeah, there's a set, as, as I mentioned, it's one of my favorite themes, actually, in chess. I have a whole collection 
of oh, yeah. stalemate puzzles. I liked. I really enjoy giving lectures on this theme. Actually, oh, yeah. oh, um, oh, right. I absolutely love stalemates uh, because it always feels as though you know. I love these. It's like a, it's like a movie when you know the underdog comes through. You know, you're in a desperate situation. It's Indiana Jones, and suddenly <laughs> it yes. looks like you. <laughs> you're doomed and then suddenly you find a way to save yourself so yeah. i love stalemates um well, that's actually a very good description of how i felt probably during this game that i couldn't quite believe it myself that mm. uh, this defense uh, simply saved the game yeah because it's not just about preventing G5, but uh, why, it, why it can't make uh, progress anymore. Yeah, this is the incredible thing. So let's let's just show the rest of the game very quickly. Can I and see where I want to look at some more games. So Queen E3 is what I played because of G5, because of this stale matrix. Yeah. Um, so the game went like this. So basically, it's it's kind of hesitation. I mean, I want to play G5 and to be able to to capture with the queen but well, it also like you this. you eliminate the stalemate so yeah exactly like yeah a safe move yeah. yeah and now you came up with this this beautiful idea absolutely beautiful queen d3 i mean yeah. this is extraordinary it's wonderful mm -hmm. um yeah. so again this is this is stalemate so i played like yeah. this yeah um now in fact you can actually take on a3 here Oh really? Yeah, really. But any in any case, what you did is actually very safe. Yeah. You just started checking. And yeah, as you point out in the book, the problem is that in fact in many positions you can simply take here because um the A pawn is, is far enough mm -hmm. up the board and around about here, well, mm -hmm. I just gave up actually. I offered a draw. Yeah, um, there's yeah, there's yeah. no further progress to be made. Yeah, yeah. A, a fantastic save. I <laughs> do you know what? I think this was the penultimate round, wasn't it? Um, that I don't remember, but uh, I, I I do remember that a lot uh, depended on this game. Yeah, I'm not sure price money or just honor but uh, yes we must have been looking at uh, the final uh, standings of the tournament yeah. already and yeah. and the funny thing is i have no recollection whatsoever of mm. what i did in the final round <laughs> oh well uh... absolutely none at all <laughs> but i remember but i do remember the feeling of mm. we finished the game very late at night and yes. as is traditional in these open tournaments mm -hmm. in the last round, that one had to get up very early in the morning and you played at some godforsaken hour. Yeah, 10 o'clock perhaps. Yeah. yeah. 